Hello. We're happy to introduce our second speaker, Gloria Oyarstabal. Hello, um, good morning. Uh, thank you everyone that is here listening to me. And thank you Lance Krona Photo for inviting me once again. It's always a pleasure to come back. Uh, I was lucky enough to be here 2017 um, as a shortlisted for the Dummy Award, which I luckily got won and could publish my first photo book. So I'm super happy to be back. I'm going to present to you a little bit my um, work in progress project that I'm into now. It's a project that I started in 2019 while um, when I came back in 2017 from my artist residence in Lagos, where I developed my previous project, uh, Woman Go No Agree. Um, I realized I had the same um, reaction that I was working on. I'm going to explain it to you more, but so like a couple of years later, I thought um, that reaction didn't, um, I wasn't comfortable with it. So I had to work a little bit on it. And that's why on 2019, uh, 2020, when my previous project was having um, quite success or um, um, visibility, um, my uh, after the sentence friends told me, why do you white uh, people or white women keep on going to Africa and talk about Africa and then come back to Europe and keep on reinforcing that imaginary that uh, you're talking about. So why don't you talk a little bit about what you have uh, at home? So that's what I, I did. Basically, I started to think and research about what was happening with that imaginary in our land. So instead of uh, going back to Africa, which I usually keep on doing, I mean, I'm working now in Ghana and in Tanzania, but uh, this project is developed mainly in, in Europe. So when I was in 2017 in Lagos, uh, one of my uh, main research paths was working in the National Museum, uh, a place that I, knew before and that it always um, shocked me because I found a very, very chaotic and empty museum. And I knew that N Nigerian art was very, very important and there were a lot of um, art from um, very, very old times. So um, I thought, why these museums are empty? And of course, I found this kind of, of information. We are um, the owners of the concept of, of a museum, no? Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I started asking myself some questions as I always do. I, that's my, my method. I ask myself like very uncomfortable questions, no? Like what makes a museum? and is the Western Museum concept universal and exportable? Uh, so that's the main um, physical place where I work, but not only that. So we have to think that uh, humans, or maybe Western humans, are um, collectors. We like to collect and we have to, we want, we like to display things, and that way of displaying things makes a narrative. And that narrative, it's always uh, political. It's um, something that is, um, comes from a, from a uh, time, from a situation of uh, a society. 
So museums can't be neutral. They are a um, consequence of what society is evolving, evolution of the society. So uh, mainly uh, what I thought, what I, I was like starting to think is that it was a lot of responsibility in the museum and there was a lot of information and it was only part of the information and who chose that information and how it was uh, um, displayed and how it was uh, narrated. Um, so it was very much linked uh, to the concept of nation and of course to the concept of patriotism. So I, in my previous uh, uh, projects, I talk about um, those concepts of beauty, of beauty canons, and how um, uh, dangerously they can be linked to, to this hierarchy of, um, of evolution, no? in, a, in a very, um, in that what I call social Darwinism. No, Darwin uh, made this uh, selection of or hierarchies of animals in the evolution. And I think in, in society we can find that too. So uh, William E. B. Du Bois, which was one of the first uh, black people that mm, in the United States started to, 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 to talk openly about these concepts uh, said uh, uh, double consciousness, a sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. So we are defining the other to define us. So my previous project started with a white point in hand and that's what mainly uh, I think anthropology is uh, made by and made for. It's that um, uh, the, the, the definition of the other uh, defines what we are not and vice versa. So of course, um, whiteness and white privilege is always uh, in my project. And beauty concepts. It is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. That's what Audre Lorde, a famous um, poet and activist, uh, lesbian uh, American. So as I was telling you, oops, well, the, sorry about the picture on the, on the right. I don't know why it is like that. It's my uh, second photo book, the one in the left is the one that I published here in Landskrona. Um, so this uh, project comes from the idea when I was in Nigeria, I talked with a lot with Azun Nwagbogu, which um, came here a few years ago. He's uh, the director of uh, the African Artists Foundation and of Lagos Photo. And he was very much into this restitution of the Benin bronze which mainly, I'm going to make this story very short, but in 1897, there was a punitive expedition in, in, in Nigeria in what is called the Benin Kingdom. Not, doesn't, uh, refers to the Benin country, but it's the Edo uh, province. Uh, so they um, raised a whole kingdom and took uh, thousands of very, very valuable um, objects. And part of those objects were the Benin bronze, which uh, they were spread around the world, well, mainly Western museums, and which now since, well, it's, they've been uh, um, asked for this uh, restitution since the 60s, 70s, since the independence, but now since maybe lately, or that's what I, I, I see. There's a lot of movement and things are going, starting to change. So this is another image of with all these bronze on the floor, which are these ones, uh, they are mainly on the British Museums, which 
which is the museum which is more septic or more um, negative about restitution. Uh, they are um, pieces, some of them from the 14th, 15th century, uh, made by of bronze or made by of ivory. This is uh, in in British Museum. So uh, one of the museums that was very very helpful and very open to my in, uh, research was the Museum of Africa in Terburin in Belgium, which is very near of, uh, to Brussels, and which was the the pavilion summer pavilion of um, King Leopold II. Um, which, uh, when it opened, it was uh, the, the idea of showing all these objects that came from the colony um, was the idea of justifying that colonization. Uh, so um, the human zoo, it wasn't called like that, but it was now renamed years later as a human zoo. It was like a universal exhibition uh, so you can find images like this, how they were uh, forced to act as a, in a Western way. There were in the first human zoo there were like 260 people, uh, many died, and now years later, what is happening is that reviewing the history and reviewing the narrative, there's a lot of protest. So what happened that in 2020, apart from the pandemic uh, lockdown, we had this uh, huge global movement of the, uh, the Black Lives Matter, and the consequences was uh, not only uh, about the black people rights, of course, very, very, Im that was like the main uh, skeleton, but the consequences was as you might know, is the fall of the monuments and what it meant. So that's Le Leopold II and the, the sculpture that it's in, in Terburen. So the, the Leopold II is uh, part of my previous of, of the photo book, the project that was published here. And that was the 23 years of the Congo Free State where the um, amputations was uh, very famous afterwards. So this is what happened in the age of the Conference of Berlin, where the Africa is, is splitted. And this was in 1958 during the Congorama. Uh, at the same year they were building that. So imagine the, the shock. So this is the museum. They, for years, they, they invested a lot of money to re, uh, review their narrative and they put everything that was painful in a room downstairs, which is called uh, the off-site room, which are mainly all the sculptures that were exhibited before and that were painful for the uh, Afro-descendants community. But then I found things like that, which I didn't feel they were very appropriate. So um, anthropology and distinction is very linked to supremacy discourses, as you might know. These classifications of human and, of course, all these images that come from this book that was uh, rather controversial, The Sex, Race and Colonialism in 2018. So this is the, the, oh my goodness, I don't know what happens with this. These are not, okay, this is all cut. So this is part of this project, which is, as I told you, is a work in progress project, which I'm, call, I'm talking about all this restitution uh, uh, subject, but also about how the African woman was uh, represented in uh, Western art. And uh, so I used the um, dance because I come a lot of from contemporary dance, 
and uh, of course animals are also part of the, that exotism that is reinforced in these museums. And this is part of a video that I'm working on that would be a double channel video. Some of these images, you can find them there in, in, a, in a spread. So this is the part that where I'm researching about the representation of the African woman and the relationship with the white woman. So as you can see, she's always uh, represented in a, in a lower social level and a very exotic, very, it, it has uh, part of her representation is uh, the odalisk, which is linked to the orientalism. And of course, all these images that, sorry if you feel a little bit disturbed, but they're strong. Uh, they're how they were used in the porn uh, world, uh, the relationship between the wo uh, white women and black women. And this is my last slide because this is uh, the beginning of uh, a new part of the project, which I am representing this uh, painting, which I found it was the only one that I think it represents in a very horizontal way. It's said that it was um, a relationship, with those a sexual relationship with those be between those two women. And so that's it. I don't know if you have any questions of... Hello? <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's kind of two parts in my question. Um, one is if you know about any initiative where... Sorry? Do, uh, do you know about initiatives where they are um, giving back the artifacts to the African countries, um, and the other is that as I was looking and hearing you, I was thinking about that those artifacts is like taken out of a context, and um, that must be very important to the African people, and now they have to like, um, rebuild their history. A, a lot of information has been gone because it's taken out of the context and like you were telling yeah. about the narratives, it's been, in my mind, distorted and uh, it's a lot of information that has been lost. Um, so rebuilding this one, if they get those artifacts back, do you know anything about how they're thinking about that, if it exists? There's a lot written down. There's a lot talked about. Um, it said that 90% of African art is in our museums or in our private collections. Or, so that's like a big, white, or black hole in the narrative. So the problem now, there's a wonderful artist called Kader Atia, which is working a lot in this, and he made this video that asks every single person that is involved in this, from the museums till the people in the village. Uh, so the problem is that, okay, so what do we do with this? No problem, if because some museums, they don't even want to talk about it, but I mean, 
society is pushing, no? This decolonization process is touching everything. The academy, the um, educational programs, the institutions. Um, so it's slowly moving a little bit. So, okay, so there are so many English museums that are uh, saying, okay, I'm going to review all my collections and go one by one. Of course, uh, uh, President Macron in, in France uh, asked uh, Felguin Sarr, which is an inter uh, S um, Senegal intellectual, and Benedict um, Savoy, which is a French historian, and they made the Sarr Savoy um, manifest, which they said that was in 2018, I think, and that started to move a little bit, the, the concert, the Musée de l'Homme, the Cabronly, all these museums that have so much information and so much artifacts. But okay, so once you say, all right, we will give it back, where do they go back? Do the people want it back? So many of those artifacts, they are supposed to be returned to conflict zones. So they are not available to receive it, or maybe they're thinking about so many other things. Uh, the case of Nigeria, for example, they're building a big, huge museum in the Edo province near the Benin City Kingdom. Uh, huge, like very modern, and so they will probably receive all these Benin bronze. But the Benin bronze is just a tiny part of all these uh, looted uh, art, no? So, um, first it will ha be very uh, important to know which objects are uh, due to be returned. Because if they were bought, if they were paid, they don't have to be returned. They should not be returned unless they were paid back. But if they were looted, if they were robbed, if, if it's a uh, war, situation, that's another situation, and that's another law, and that's another conversation. So it's very, very complex, uh, but at least things are moving, and there's people pointing to all these um, people working in the museums, and they feel they have to talk about it. So that's very important. And the, then, I was the last thing I wanted to point out is that oh, many of these artifacts uh, they have this spiritual um, function in the society, and once they are uh, robbed or violently uh, taken away, the, that the spirituality is lost. So maybe it's useless to put it back. And of course, uh, will they put it back in a, in a glass case or in a shrine or in a house or where? Because maybe it's not our concept of being in a white cube with light and people going to visit it. If it maybe it's meant to be in another place, no? But I think all in the case of the Benin bronze, the, the, the ones that are the, the square ones, it's really like our um, paintings that they are a narrative and they're telling about the, the Portuguese when they arrived in the 15th century. And it, it's part of a, of a tale. So it's important they, at least they, they have it and at least they, they part of a society will have access to it. But there's the, that's a tiny part of it. Question? Thank you. So I really don't remember what I wanted to say because why, while you were talking, I had like so many things in mind. But uh, just um, I I was watching a video last week and uh, they were filming uh, a couple of people talking about returning the artworks, and most of them were like. Anyway, like even if they get returned, they've spent so much time in other countries that now their like buddies don't tell the same stories and like they don't have the same role as before. So it's like if they were alive and like they were on exile for so long, 
So like we, we won't be able to communicate the same way. So it's like, okay, you can return them. But even like almost as part of uh, a European way to like show them as in, okay, if you return them, they're gonna be in a museum, but that's not what they were made for initially. So we don't really care that much like having them in a museum because initially they were not here to be in a museum. Uh, and it, it's very funny because it also reminded me, I, so I live in Morocco, I was born and raised there, and I don't know what happened in Morocco 10 years ago, but they started like opening these big museums, and it's like, we, so we go from like no Na museum nothing to, to, to like uh, Morocco alongside Nigeria and South Africa becoming like art centers in Africa. The thing is the museum, so like you have this huge building, but it's only, uh, filled with people like on the opening and then the exhibition lasts three months but like there's no one and for example if I see my family or like my friends that are not artists like they only go to the museum when I have an exhibition for them the museum is amen but like <laughs> there is no such thing as a museum the rest of the time of course but and that's but educational yeah and, and if but the problem is is it the way to no. narrate? I mean, is it universal? No. Is everyone in the global planet has to uh, have a relationship to artifacts as we do? No, because like, for example, my parents, it's not like they, they didn't know what art or like culture was. It's just that they don't know it this way because to them, like art is uh, more either like outside uh, in like, um, Square, for example, in Marrakesh, where like you have people telling stories, or when they were kids, they all like played theater in like local um, art centers. Although they were more called like uh, youth centers, uh, but like there are a thousand different ways for them to see art. But mm -hmm. like the museum is definitely not one of them. To, to them, the museum is like the elite thing, they don't understand what's going on there, yes. but like to them, they will never go because first of all, it's like a certain type of people, most of the time that are like from the bourgeois class and that don't speak the same language. And honestly, like sometimes when I go to the museum in Morocco or like the School of Fine Arts, even me as an artist, I'm like, what the fuck is this like? But I in Spain, it was the same yeah. 30 years ago. We have the Prado, we have huge, super important museums, but it wasn't for the mm. people on the street. Yeah. It was for the people, for the light, for the bourgeois, for, as you said. And it's very important what you're saying, that there's so many societies and communities that work in orality, yeah. not objects. Yeah. So what's the point? Mm. What's the point? I mean, it's great to recuperate all that, but let's see, let's see how. Yeah. And then the other problem is, the, this fear that you, uh, Western Museum have to get to to suddenly find themselves empty, mm. no, is what? So that's why I put all these uh, glass cases empty. No, it's what? And that was in uh, in Egypt, in the in the museum that is they're going to move everything. So it was that moment of of, of uh, void, and so it was it was uh, yes. I mean all that. Oh, I mean, there's so much to talk about it, and it's on not only museums, but um, again, it's like a neo-colonialism, you know, and that's what interests me. And I just had one question: uh, like, have you, throughout your research, met, for example, people or like museums who were willing to return some artworks, but like maybe find um, like a way to? Like, the, the, I mean, the museums that are scared about returning the artworks in a place where, like, there aren't enough infrastructures for, like, the artworks a to lot. be... Yeah. So, like, are there, like, initiatives where they're willing, for example, to collaborate with, like, archaeology or, like, preservation schools or, like, universities or, like, whatever, in order to find, like, a common way that is not the museum, but that is, like, a way to preserve them without them being mm. in a museum or? Yes, for example, in, in Leipzig in, in Germany, they are uh, working together a lot with um, Cape Town uh, uh, un University to see what's happening with all this movement. So it's great. And then in, in Dakar, they had a big uh, symposium too, like last year, in this uh, Chinese built museum, new, huge. So once again, is that concept of Disney museums, as you say, like super huge uh, 
very fancy uh, buildings. Uh, but what's the point about it? No, it's it's yes. But of course, there are, I mean, there are many people that are doing it in a in a good way, knowing that they're very being watched and they have to be very careful with what they say, what they do. But the question is, um, is this going to be only in this elite uh, level, or are they really talking with the? Uh, priests or the shaman or the people that were used to to be the the, 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 the responsible of those artifacts. And then I wanted to say the last thing is that uh, we feel that there's a big hole in African history, but history, as they say in Africa, in, in that continent is not uh, only slavery and colonization. There's a whole huge um, encyclopedia written down it's from them. Very important. Not written by us, but written. <laughs> uh, yes, that's wha why I thought it was so important. I was not thinking about to give it back to place it in museums. I was thinking of get it back to re, um, to take back their identity and their culture and their history because those artifacts and the information around them, I don't think we have the pieces in the Western world to, to, to really get the picture and to combine them and build this history and or identity. It's only them who can do that. And to do that, they have to have all those things. And they have to go back and search for their, their roots and their patterns in the world. But they have them. They have them. That's another uh, mm -hmm. way of thinking very like white, no? because I tell okay. you, sorry, but it's what I did all, like, so don't feel that I'm pointing you, but I've, I did that um, thought like years ago, no? It's like, oh, it's very important because there was like a hole in the narrative and it's only them that is going to make up this puzzle and write again, and no, they, they, it's written down by them. It's it's already uh, so. Let's say that maybe those or not all those objects are super important for them. No, uh, I don't think so. So because so mm. let's listen to them and just let's mm. if they are angry, just listen to them. If they but in any case, if you talk about feminism, if you talk about restitution, if you talk about anything because we are the ones that colonize, we are the ones that uh, um, are racist, we are the ones that are uh, always on top. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe, but as Don't from my school It's not you, huh? it's not, I'm not no, pointing to you, it's the whole general. But for me, as I went to school and I could read about how people lived before, and I also could see the things they were use, using, uh, on a picture or in some way. That made me much closer to those people. Mm. But I know that they have a lot of this still in their country, I mean, well, but I think they should choose what they need and what they want to, and it shouldn't be on our like our <laughs> no, <laughs> laws uh, you were talking about. Yeah. If it was bought or robbed, it doesn't matter, really. I know, but that's <laughs> where the conflict comes. No, yeah, I, if, I if, they, that. if it was mm. bought, it was paid. It was another thing. And then uh, there, there's something very Machiavellic about this because some museums, what they do is they um, offer th these pieces, these artifacts, uh, loaned. I mean, they have to pay like a rent for their own past objects. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. We Sorry are if it was too long. No, not at all, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs>